Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to another lecture in uh, American government. Uh, today's lecture is a new topic. Uh, we will deal with uh, public opinion and public ignorance. As you can see, Roman numeral one, public opinion and public ignorance. So let us begin with A, public opinion. What do we mean by public opinion? Write it down. Public opinion is the attitude, the aggregate attitude, the collective attitude of uh, citizens on issues of the day. Um, basically, issues like uh, gay marriage, issues like abortion, issues like legalizing marijuana, gun control, uh, all of these issues are considered uh, public opinion uh, relief for the pandemic, whether the government should provide financial aid to people during this pandemic, uh, all of that is part of public opinion. All right. Um, public opinion in the United States tends to be shallow and continuously changing. Why is that? Why is uh, the public not knowledgeable? Why is it shallow and continuously changing? The reason is, the main reason is this. The American public does not have a deep reservoir, a deep well of knowledge with which to form consistent and everlasting opinions, okay? Because they don't have a deep well of knowledge, then their public opinion on the issues fluctuates wildly. This is especially the case of issues on foreign policy as I shall illustrate to you right now. This is the public opinion on uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq. If you don't know, the U.S. invaded Iraq in March of 2003, and the U.S. has been in Iraq in one way or another up until this day, all right? So this is a poll that's been taken in 2013 by the Gallup organization, and it says, looking back, do you think the United States made a mistake sending troops to fight in Iraq? Now, if you go back to the earlier period, like 2004 and before, you would find that the approval, not a mistake, no, not a mistake, was at 75%. 75% of Americans believed it wasn't a mistake to send U.S. troops to Iraq. But then look what happened. As time passed, uh, by 2008, 2009, the number fell to 36%. Then it went steady at 41 to 42%. The majority today believe that this uh, war, this U.S. invasion of Iraq, was a mistake. So what happened? Why did the public move from 75% approval to only 42% approval? Well, they did not have a deep reservoir of knowledge 
with which to judge the events. They believed <clears throat> the big lie pushed by the Bush administration that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and that Iraq was involved in 9-11, even though anybody who had paid attention and did a bit of research would have known that these were lies. But the American public didn't, and therefore they supported the war. Then they discovered the truth. The truth always comes out. And once you discover the truth, uh, support for the war went down precipitously. Again, they do not have a deep reservoir of knowledge with which to judge, to, to judge events and to form solid and consistent opinions. All right. Uh, the next item is public ignorance, okay? Uh, public ignorance. Write it down. Beginning in the 1950s, uh, we had the onset of scientific polling, scientific surveys. Okay, now when these scientific surveys were conducted and the results started coming in, <clears throat> it was discovered that the public had tremendous ignorance, tremendous ignorance about the facts and figures about history, politics uh just to give you an example uh from college students all right just a random example then we'll go into details 2016 only 30 percent of students knew that only congress can declare war okay uh, <clears throat> uh only 31 percent of students could identify Israel on a map, even though the U.S. gives Israel $3.8 billion every year. Uh, only 45% of students could identify Iran on a map. All right? Stuff like that. Basic stuff. So let me show you uh, this survey on the extent on the public's ignorance on issues of the day. Uh, this is a survey from the Pew Center uh, of the Research and the Press. Now, the Pew Center and Gallup are some of the best polling organization and survey organizations that we have. If you look at Gallup numbers, you trust them. If you look at Pew numbers, just trust them. They're really, really that good. So here, uh, the blue... Uh, bars are correct and the orange bars are incorrect all right so they asked the public who wrote the federalist papers uh 88 percent did not know they didn't know uh they asked the public who was president during world war one uh 80 percent did not know crazy okay uh they asked the public uh about the constitutional convention what city was it held in 65% did not know. Uh, unemployment rate in 2017, 63% did not know. Who was the president of France? 63% uh, did not know. By the way, it's Emmanuel Macron, if you don't know. Uh, how long is a senator's term? They didn't know. They didn't know it's six years. This is like self-evident stuff. Uh, name the secretary of state. They didn't know. Uh, name a Supreme Court appointee. One, just one. They didn't know. Uh, I'm going to skip this Russian involvement in the 2016 election, which they didn't know about. Uh, which country was leaving the EU in 2017? Well, that they knew about. Who is the Speaker of the House? They knew about. Uh, what is the pollutant in Flint, Michigan's water? 72% know about. But a lot of ignorance on basic stuff. 
like uh, how many senators does a state get? Two. Two senators. Uh, what's the term of a senator? Six years. Basic stuff. All right. On top of their uh, lack of knowledge on basic civics issues, uh, Americans also lack, lag behind, Americans also lag behind some of their European counterparts when it becomes, when it comes to issues of the day. So if you compare the American public to some of the publics from Europe, you will discover that the American public is less knowledgeable than the European public among similarly advanced countries. And do I have a survey for that? Yes, you bet I do have a survey for that. Uh, here is the survey on comparative knowledge of news. It's old. I recognize it's old, but I doubt things have changed that much. Uh, comparative knowledge of news, 2009. If anything, in my opinion, things have gotten worse in the United States. So let's look at comparative knowledge. Public selected from the U.S. in blue, from the U.K. in green. Uh, Finland in yellow, and Denmark in orange, okay? So they asked them, uh, do you know what the Kyoto Protocols were, Kyoto Accords? Well, the Kyoto Accords were the predecessors to the climate treaty that was signed in Paris, France. Well, again, the public, the American public ranked class. Who were the Taliban? Now, mind you, 2009, the U.S. has already invaded Afghanistan and was fighting the Taliban. American public didn't know. Uh, Darfur, what is happening in Darfur, a region in Africa? Uh, American public was not last, but second to last. Who were the Tamil Tigers? American public did not know. Who was Milosevic? American public did not know. Who was Maliki? American public knew. Woohoo! Who was Kofi Annan? The American public did not know. Who was France's president? The American public did not know. And then the average, dead last. Okay? So not only is the American public lacking in knowledge by itself, when you compare America's knowledge to the publics from other similarly advanced countries, we, they, we are too lacking in knowledge compared to them. All right. One final item uh, that we need uh, to mention, another survey that worth talking about is this. Write it down. Not only is the American public ignorant about political issues. The American public also, the American public also, tends to be highly patriotic compared to the publics from other similarly advanced countries. Highly patriotic compared to others. And again, I have a survey to share with you on that. All right, uh, this is a survey uh, from the National Opinion Research Center IPS survey called National Pride Patriotism Index. Basically, they ask a bunch of questions and they combine an index on a scale from 5 to 25. The closer a country is to 5, the less patriotic. It is the closer a country is to 25, the more patriotic it is. As you can see, the results of the survey among similarly advanced countries varies between 14, 
lowest Sweden, so the Swedes are not that highly patriotic, to 17.7 in the United States, the Americans are highest on terms of patriotism. Okay? So uh, this uh, brings the question, the important question that we have to ask. Why, why is the combination of low political knowledge, also known as political ignorance, why is this combination of political ignorance and high levels of patriotism a dangerous one? Why is it dangerous? Okay? Why? Why is it problematic when you have a country like the United States that spends $750 billion on its defense establishment, almost 40% of the entire world, having a public that is politically ignorant and highly patriotic. Why is that dangerous? Well, it is dangerous because it allows the elites, government elites, political elites, military elites, to easily manipulate the masses into war. The biggest case of that happened after 9-11, when the elites in the government Bush and those around him, his advisors, lied to the American public about Iraq being responsible for 9-11, about Iraq having weapons of mass destruction, and that led the United States and its public to support a war and invasion of Iraq and we are still paying the consequences of this war until today. That's why this combination is dangerous. That's why the public ought to be educated about the politics and the issues of the day. And believe you me, this will repeat again. The name of the country might not be important. It could repeat with Iran. It could repeat with Venezuela. It could repeat with any country. But it will repeat again. All right. Which brings us to Roman numeral number two. Measuring public opinion. How do we measure public opinion? We have 234 million eligible voters. Okay? So the total population of America is somewhere around 330, 340 million. But 234 million are eligible voters. Okay? In uh, 2020, about two thirds of them voted. Very high voter turnout in 2020. So, how do we know? what these voters, these eligible voters, are thinking. How do we know what these adult voters are thinking? Well, sub-point A, we conduct a poll or a survey. Conduct a poll or a survey. 
How do we succeed in polling, you might ask? What do we need to do to have a successful poll? Number one, <clears throat> sample size. What should be the size of the sample? Remember, you want to know what 234 million eligible voters are thinking. What should be the size of the sample? Hmm? One million? Ten million? 15 million, all of them, what should be the size? Well, ideally, it should be all of them. But you can't do that. It's too expensive. You don't have the time. By the time you finish surveying 234 million, the results are old. <laughs> so what should be the size of the survey? the size of the sample. Write it down. For a successful poll, the size of the sample is somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people. Yes, 800 to 1,000 people. Yes, surveying a 1,000 people random and representative sample will tell you what 234 million eligible voters are thinking. Yes, it works that way. No, I am not a statistician to explain it for you, but that's the way it works. So between 800 to 1,000 people. Now, why this magic number 800 to 1,000? Usually 1,000. Why this magic number? Write it down. This magic number is used because anything below 800 in the sample and the error in the sample grows, something called sampling error. The error in the sample grows, anything below 800. And anything above 1,000, anything above 1,000, does not reduce the sample error by much. And you are simply wasting your time and wasting your money. Okay? So the sample size is usually between 800 to 1,000 people. Let me show you some examples, shall we? Uh, this is a screenshot <clears throat> from a website called pollingreport.com. So if you want uh, to find polling on almost anything, uh, you go there, pollingreport.com and they aggregate all the polls and they will put them in a list for you. This is President Biden job approval ratings, right? Do you approve or disapprove of the way Joe Biden is handling his job as president? Now that's not our focus. Our focus is the, uh, mar the uh, N, see that it says N under the first one, Quinnipiac University poll, February 11, 14, 2021, N, 1,056 adults nationwide, right? This N is the number of respondents, the size of the sample, 1,056. Remember I told you between 800 to 1,000. So the next one, uh, N, 906 adults nationwide from the Gallup poll. Another one, 1,313 from the Marist poll, okay? Another one, Monmouth University poll, 809. So anything that falls between 800 and 1,000 will have the potential to be a good poll. All right, is this clear? Excellent. 
Uh, next item for uh, success in polling that you need to know about is randomness. A poll should collect its respondents randomly, okay? Meaning the sample that is between 800 to 1,000 must be collected randomly. What does that mean? Write it down. Randomness means that any person in the population should have, should have an equal chance of being in the sample. Let's say uh, we were in class and our class, uh, physical, we were in a physical class, not a virtual class like this one, and we had 135 students, and I wanted to extract from these 135 students a random sample. How do I do it? How do I do a random sample? Well, one way to do it is to put the names of every person on an equal sized small piece of paper, fold them all the same way, put them in a paper bag, shake the bag, and then pull a sample out, let's say 30. I want a sample of 30 out of 135. And I will randomly pull 30. That is what it means to have a random sample. Now, you're thinking to yourself, gosh, man, we have 234 million eligible voters. How do we do that? How do we conduct a random sample from 234 million voters? Well, simple. Almost everyone has a phone number, whether it is a landline, whether it is a cell phone. Everyone has a phone number. Now, you take all these phone numbers and you put them in a computer. And you use software that will conduct random digit dialing. Random digit dialing. It will dial the numbers randomly. And then you will extract a sample of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, etc., etc. Is this clear? Good. Next item that we have to concern ourselves with is representative. The random sample must also be representative of the demographics of the population. The random sample must be representative of the demographics. What does that mean, demographics? Demographics usually include the following. Race, gender, income, education, region, sexual orientation, political ideology, political party identification. Okay, so the sample must reflect, must reflect, must be representative of the demographics in the population. We know, for example, we know that 52% of the population are women. 52% of the voters are women. So what percentage of the population in the sample should be women? 
52%. We know, for example, that about 12 to 13% are African Americans in the voting population. So what percent do we put in the sample? 12 to 13 percent, and so on and so forth, until you make the sample representative of the American public. Is this clear? Next item on the agenda is question wording. Write it down. The questions asked must be clear, standardized, unbiased, and must not, must not lead the respondent into answering one way or another. Clear, standardized unbiased, should not lead the respondent. Now, let me show you an example of what we mean by that. This is a survey by GSS, General Social Survey, and it asks the same respondents a question in two different ways, right? The green trace asks, are we spending too little on the poor? And the blue trace asks, are we spending too little on welfare? So one of them uses poor, one of them uses welfare. Now, when the word poor is used, more than 70% said that the United States is spending too little on the poor. By contrast, when the word welfare is used, only slightly higher than 20% of the same sample said that America is spending too little on welfare. But it's the same question. Welfare is spent on the poor. But in the United States, thanks in large part to Reagan and since Reagan, uh, being on welfare has been, uh, how shall I say, made to feel that there is something wrong, that you are scamming the system. You know, the idea of welfare queens. But in reality, the overwhelming majority of people on welfare are there because they have to. They do not choose to. They have to. But notice, you use a different verbiage, you get different results. Now, if you were a Republican pollster, you would use the verbiage of welfare. If you were a Democratic pollster, you would use the verbiage of poor. But the point is that the question wording also impacts the results of the survey. So be very, very careful when conducting a survey and when reading a survey to make sure the questions are clear, unbiased, and not misleading. So after question wording comes professional surveyors. Write it down. Uh, those 
who ask the survey questions must be trained professionals. They should not, they should not use their voice or their facial expressions to lead or mislead the respondent. All right? Let's say I was a surveyor and I am sitting in front of someone and I'm asking them a question. And the question is this. Do you approve or disapprove of the way President Biden is doing his job? And then I put a broad smile on my face. Okay? Or I nod like this. What am I saying? Well, what I am saying here is I am leading the respondent into saying that he or she approves of the way President Biden is conducting his job. I am leading the respondent. I should not use my voice. I should not use my facial expression. I should not nod. I should not do any of that. I just ask the question, note the answer, and move on to the next question. Number six is the halo effect. Write it down. Survey takers must avoid the halo effect. Now, what is the halo effect? The halo effect is the tendency of respondents to give politically and socially acceptable answers. Okay, tendency of respondents to give politically and socially acceptable answers. Let's say I was in a classroom context. People want to be agreeable. They don't want to be disagreeable. And I asked this question. And I asked people to agree or disagree. Right? Here is the statement. And I asked it in the classroom. I will not vote. I will not vote for a transsexual or a gay president. Okay. How many people would raise their hand in the context of our classroom? Few, if any. Why? Because to hold such an opinion is now socially unacceptable. And therefore, people censor themselves. But in the quietness of a booth, an election booth, there is nobody there. And so they vote the way they believe they should vote. Another uh, statement. And uh, again, let's say we are in the context of 135 student class. Here's the statement. Veterans who fought in the Iraq war are criminals. How many do you think would raise their hands in the context of a classroom? Few, if any. Why? Because in America, we revere the veterans, those who joined the military. 
and therefore it is socially unacceptable to agree with such a statement. So when you are a surveyor, you must try and avoid the halo effect, which is the tendency of respondents to give you politically or socially acceptable answers. Finally, item seven, under success in polling, margin of error. Write it down. Every survey publishes two numbers. Remember, I showed you. The one number is the number of respondents. 1,000, 800, 900, 1,300, I showed you that number. The other number that is also published is a plus or minus number, okay? Plus or minus number. This is known as the margin of error. This is known as the margin of error. Let me show you from our previous example. So let's look at the uh, President Biden job rating approval, uh, Knipiak University poll, uh, number of cases 1,056, and there's the margin of error plus or minus three, plus or minus three percent, okay? Now, we know, according to the poll, that 50% approve of the way Joe Biden is handling his job as president. But the margin of error is plus or minus three. So what could that 50% be? when the margin of error is plus or minus three. That 50% could be minus three, which is 47%, or plus three, which is 53%. So there is a margin of error in the poll of plus or minus three percentage points. Let's go to the poll below it, the Gallup poll. All right, again, 906 adults nationwide, margin of error plus or minus four, and approval rating 54%, 57%. So that 57% can be plus four or minus four. Go down, Marist poll, again. Uh, 1,313 adult, margin of error 3.3%, 49% can be 49 plus 3.3% or 49 3.3%. Go down to the Monmouth poll. Adults, 809, margin of error plus or minus 3.5%. Okay? Same idea applies. Now, what is the consensus? What is the consensus among pollsters on what is an acceptable margin of error? The acceptable margin of error is somewhere between plus or minus three and plus or minus four. That makes for a good poll. So if you are one of the people who are studying polls, right? You are following polls, and that is your job is to consume them. What do you focus on? You make sure that the number of adults is high, and you make sure that the margin of error is low. So if you find a poll that has a number of about 700, and the margin of error is plus or minus 4.5, what do you do with the poll? Do you trust it? Do you accept its result? Absolutely not. You ignore it. 
And that is why, this brings us to my final item, that when you do polls, when you study polls, you should do them in bunches. Let me show you. This is a website <clears throat> called 538, 538.com. Okay. Now, this website, one of the things that it does is it aggregates all the polls and presents them to us as a holistic uh, approach to polling, right? So let's interact with this website, shall we? All right, here it is. So how popular is Joe Biden or how unpopular is Joe Biden? And you scroll down, you see all the polls, just all polls, right? And every and, I, and as you move along, you can see the numbers change, right? All polls, and you go, you can do a drop down from all polls to something else. You can change it to adults and non-adults and everything, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not going to do that. So all polls, and then you go down here, and you see the list of polls that they aggregate, right? They aggregate all the polls, and they give them a grade, A minus, B plus, C, et cetera, et cetera. And then they present them to you as an aggregate. Every dot up here is a poll, right? And every dot down here in orange is also a poll. So overall, overall, as of February 22nd, 2021, <clears throat> uh, Biden's approval rating is at 55%. Okay, 55% of Americans approve, 37.7% of Americans disapprove. But this is early because this is just the honeymoon period and things can change as we move along. Okay. Roman numeral number three. Uh, what is a liberal? What is a conservative? what is a populist and what is a libertarian now remember what i told you about find out on your own what that means it means it's in the book i'm not going to cover it and it also means it will be on your exam so find out on your own about about each one of these political ideologies, and that's what they are, they're political ideologies, and what their stand on the issues is. Now, to help you out, <clears throat> I created a table, a chart, on my website, under Political Science 100 links, under four political ideologies. So go to writeitdownprof.com, go to political science 100 links, scroll down until you find four political ideologies and display it. So I'm gonna display it for you here so I can explain to you how you read it. All right, here's the four political ideologies, right? Uh, this is the way you read it. You look at the top and it says liberal on economic issues. And you look to the left and it says liberal on social issues. So if you are liberal on economic issues, if you are liberal on social issues, what is your stand on the issues? You support abortion, gay rights, civil rights. You support government programs to help poor disadvantaged. You support government regulation of the economy so that the disaster that happened in Texas would not happen again. You support affirmative action. You oppose the death penalty. You do not object to flag burning. You support pot legalization. You support protecting the environment. You support gun control. You oppose free trade agreements and you oppose prayer in school. Now let's go and look at the conservative. You are conservative on economic issues, conservative on social issues. What is your stand? 
You oppose gay rights, abortion rights, and civil rights. You oppose government programs to help the poor and disadvantaged. You oppose government regulation of the economy. You oppose affirmative action. You oppose drug legalization. You oppose gun control. You support free trade agreements. You support prayer in school. All right? Do you understand how you read this? All right? So it's your job to study this and understand what are the issues that people oppose or support that puts them into a liberal category, a libertarian category, a conservative category, and a populist category. All right, so we have come to the end of uh, the lecture. We're almost at the top of the hour. Remember, I try to keep my lectures to around one hour or so, 50 to one hour, 50 minutes to one hour. So we have reached that. So I will stop here. And as always, I will say bye-bye.